The Boltzmann brain is an interesting conclusion which can be drawn when we consider various physical laws which we all accept in the modern day. In order to understand and appreciate what a Boltzmann brain is, and why some physicists believe it makes sense for us to be one, we must firstly delve into the principle underlying physics, notably thermodynamics. You might be wondering how thermodynamics, which is the study of heat and energy flow, relates to the universe, cosmology and our existence on the most fundamental scale. Let's begin by considering what heat and temperature really is. We know that matter consists of particles, which are tiny individual entities interacting with each other. The presence of temperature causes particles to vibrate and move. Temperature is directly related to the average kinetic energy of the particles in the medium. In hotter objects, the particles move around quicker and more erratically, and the reverse is true for colder ones. But how does temperature and the heat energy attributed to temperature spread throughout a medium? This is important, and the answer is diffusion. Diffusion is governed by a second-order partial differential equation, but this isn't a maths video, so I'm not going to be solving any equations. When you introduce some hotter, faster-moving particles into an ensemble of cooler, slower-moving ones, the heat spreads out and diffuses between them equally over large scales due to the faster particles colliding with the slower ones, transferring some momentum, which happens between all the particles many times until most of the particles are all moving with pretty much the same speed. Yes, some particles will be moving quicker than others for short periods of time, but the average speed of all the particles will reach equilibrium. That's why I say temperature is the measure of average kinetic energy. Bringing a hot object and a cold one together, the average temperature will equalise some points in the middle, but individual particles can be moving with any speed. Diffusion is a crucial part of thermodynamics, but is there another way of understanding why diffusion happens? The answer is yes, and it's through simply counting particles. Let's now consider an ensemble of particles where half of them are red and the other half are blue. To begin with, the two sets of colours are separated in a box. Then we go and shake the box and allow the particles to move around randomly. What are the chances of the two sets of particles remaining separated into their respective red and blue colour groups? Well, let's do it by counting. There's only a few ways we can organise the set of only a few particles so that the red and blues are separate. Now let's see how many ways we can organise them so that the red and blues are mixed. As you can see, there's many, many more. And crucially, as we add more particles, there remains only a few ways to organise them as separate, but exponentially more ways to organise them in a random mess. Note here, I'm saying that all the ways we can organise the particles as a random mess are indistinguishable. For example, take the following arrangement. You'd agree it's very random and mixed. If I was to swap a red and blue around, it would look like this. Still very random. In fact, the two states of the system are essentially the same. The overall properties of the system are the same, so the two states are indistinguishable here. This is what I mean by adding more particles adds exponentially to the number of indistinguishable states, but doesn't significantly add to the number of clearly identifiable separate states. There's one way to separate all these particles into their respective colours along this dimension, but many more ways where they look like a random mess. We are not bothered about individual particles, but the system as a whole. So if these particles instead of being red and blue were, say, oxygen and carbon dioxide, then shaking the box is analogous to diffusion. If the two gases start off as separate, over time as diffusion happens, they always end up mixed. This isn't to do with some thermodynamics magic, it's simple probability. There are so, so many more ways to organise the gases as mixed than as separate, that you will always see them as mixed. Remember this statement as it will come up again later. In a room, there will be of order of Avogadro's number of particles, and hence many more ways that they can be mixed than separate so we always see diffusion occur in a gas. The temperature and kinetic energy example I used earlier is slightly different, as speeds are continuous, not discrete like red and blue. But the point remains. There are many more ways the energy is fairly equally spread between all particles than just a few hogging it all and moving around much quicker. Is there a way we can quantify this mixing or disorder of particles? The answer is yes, and that is the concept of entropy. Often given a reputation of being confusing and difficult to understand, Entropy is a fundamental concept which simply quantifies the disorder of a system. Take our box of red and blue particles again. If the system is in the separated state, it has low entropy. The particles are neatly organised into separate groups and there is practically no disorder. As diffusion occurs and they jumble up, they end up in one of the many more randomly assorted states. They are disordered and now the state has high entropy. This is important as it also defines the direction of time as entropy will always increase in a closed system over time. Just like how you should never expect a system to spontaneously order into separate red and blue sections, 
it will always become more mixed over time as you shake the box and entropy increases. This can be seen in everyday life when you mix coffee with milk, for example. They start off separate, but as mixing and diffusion occurs, they form a homogeneous mixture where the particles are randomly assorted. The disorder of the final state is large. Entropy starts off small, but always increases over time. This is the second law of thermodynamics and occurs in any closed, isolated system. You might be thinking that things such as a refrigerator go against this law. Over time, the air in the fridge gets colder, the particles become slower moving and decrease in entropy. However, refrigerators aren't isolated. They change the pressure of other fluids to cool them down and take out heat from the inside and dump it on the outside. This is why the back of a refrigerator feels warm. The entropy of the universe still increases as the decrease in entropy inside the fridge is balanced and offset by the increase in entropy outside the fridge. Entropy always increases over time, except the isolated system here isn't the fridge, it's the entire universe. But crucially, this does mean that entropy can decrease locally, like the inside of the fridge, provided that it's made up for someplace else, like the hotter air outside the fridge. Okay, I've now arrived at diffusion and entropy from simply counting particles. I think we're ready to apply this to something bigger. We know that space and time began at the Big Bang, but what caused them to spontaneously come into existence out of nothing? If the universe was an isolated, empty system with increasing entropy, how did galaxies, stars, planets, life and everything else all form? All of these things are highly ordered and are therefore low entropy. The universe has vast amounts of empty space and then very organised areas of gas which make up galaxies. It seems very organised and low entropy, but how is this possible as we know entropy must increase over time? Well, let's go back to counting particles in the box. As the box is jumbled, many different assortments of particles occur, almost all of which are just mixed and random. However, given enough time, we should expect eventually the very organised states to occur. Even though it's highly unlikely, if we waited many years, eons in fact, then eventually it will happen. That's just probability. It's not a 0% chance of happening, just extremely low. So perhaps something like that happened to create our universe. It started off homogeneous and mixed, and in that state, time didn't really exist, as almost all mixing just left the universe in an indistinguishable homogeneous state. But eventually, after eons and eons, a highly ordered state spontaneously appeared from the mixing in some part of the universe, and allowed for some gas to get so dense that they collapsed into stars, and the universe as we know it could begin. It's not impossible, just highly unlikely, but given enough time, it should happen. So perhaps this is how the universe came to be, simply from probability. But there's one fairly big problem with this. The universe is so vast and contains billions upon billions of stars. It's not just ordered, it's extremely ordered. Surely if one was shaking the hypothetical universe box, we would expect, say, just a single galaxy to appear first. It's way more likely that the system becomes more ordered enough to allow for just one galaxy than an entire universe of galaxies. But that's not what we see. We can take this further, it's more likely a single star and solar system pops into existence than a whole galaxy. And further still, it's more likely that just one planet arises. So why do we see an entire universe? You could take what's known as the anthropic approach and argue that we got an entire universe because the other things alone aren't enough for life to arise. So if they did exist first, but couldn't form intelligent life, then we wouldn't be there to see it. And so we're biased by our observation that we exist in the first place. But another approach is that the universe actually doesn't exist how we perceive it. Continue that thought experiment of a single galaxy is more likely than a whole universe, but a single star is more likely still, but a single planet is more likely than that, and eventually you'll end up that the most likely small amount of order which could arise randomly is a single brain capable of imagining and perceiving a universe and reality in its mind. The spontaneous coming together of the billions of particles necessary to form a brain-like structure is far more likely than the billions upon billions upon billions needed to spontaneously order to form an entire universe, or galaxy, or star, etc. So following this reasoning, it's far more likely that a single brain was formed which perceives your reality. This is the idea of the Boltzmann brain. Using statistical physics and counting particles, we have come to the conclusion that it's highly unlikely the universe is actually real, and in fact you exist as just a single brain, imagining reality in an otherwise disordered, high-entropy, homogeneous universe. But just because it makes sense statistically speaking, it doesn't mean the conclusion that everything is just the false memories and illusion from a spontaneous Boltzmann brain is really what's happened. Earlier I discussed how the Boltzmann brain could explain what happened before the Big Bang, with particles in a high-entropy state randomly coming together to briefly form a brain, which all reality is perceived from. But the idea of beginning before the Big Bang is murky and undetermined. 
In fact, modern cosmologists believe time itself began at the Big Bang. So asking what happened before the Big Bang is not even a valid question. If the Big Bang was a true singularity, then indeed there could be no way of knowing if there was anything before it, or if before even existed. But remember I mentioned how time is defined by the increase of entropy in the universe. In a homogeneous high entropy universe, time may be irrelevant as the system stays at maximum entropy. Mixing an already mixed cup of coffee doesn't change how it looks. Watching a video of that, you couldn't tell if it was being played it forward or in reverse. So one could argue that time doesn't exist in such a high entropy state. This could then lend itself nicely to the Boltzmann brain conclusion, as after a long time, one should expect a random coming together of particles to manifest a brain. So the idea of a Boltzmann brain cannot be discarded at present. And with that, I thank you for watching. Leave a comment letting me know your thoughts on this, and I'll see you next time.